Everything you have been told about money is wrong. This is part one of a whiteboard series on my good buddy, Jeff Snyder. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, we're going to go over how most people view the banking system and money creation. They see banks as intermediaries of a fractional reserve system. Most people get this, but let's review it really quick before we go into the mind blowing stuff. Bank A is right here and Saver Steve saved up 100 bucks and he deposited that in his bank and the bank has $100 in deposit. That is a liability on their balance sheet. They owe that to Saver Steve. Those $100 becomes an asset in reserves that the bank can then lend out. If we have a 10% reserve requirement, borrower Bill can come along and borrow $90. Well, let's say seller Sam is with bank B and he just happens to have a house that's worth $90. And he says, borrower Bill, I will sell that house to you. So borrower Bill takes out that loan for $90 and gives it to seller Sam. Well, let's look at what's happened to the bank's balance sheets. Bank A now has a $90 loan and $10 in reserves. Their liabilities are still the same. They have $100 in deposits that they owe Saver Steve. Well, that loan, the money from that goes over to Sam's bank account at Bank B. So now they have $90 in deposits and $90 in reserves. And this process continues until the reserves are maxed out. Let's take it one step further. Bank B has the $90 in deposits, so they need to keep $9 in reserves for that 10% reserve requirement. They lend out $81. Let's say that goes over to bank C. That becomes a liability and an asset for them. Because of the fractional reserve banking, we started with $100 in deposits, but now we have $271 in deposits, and that would multiply all the way up to $1,000. And you may be saying to yourself, yeah, George, I get it. I understand that. I learned that in school and I've watched other YouTube videos. But keep in mind, the reason I am going over this is to tell you that this is not the way it works. More on that in step number two. Step number two, we've got to start looking at banks as money creators and not intermediaries. This is what I mean by that. Bank A and Saver Steve is back, but this time instead of a hundred bucks, he's only got about 10 bucks. So he deposits that into the bank that goes onto the liability side of their balance sheet. The asset side, they have $10 in reserves. Instead of them lending out $9 and having $1 in reserves against that $10 deposit, Again, a 10% reserve requirement. What they usually do in practice is they'll just take that $10 in reserves and loan $90 against that, creating $90 in new deposits. To get a better visual of this, let's check out the Bank of England's 2014 report on money creation. Jeff Snyder and I discussed this report extensively in the video we released last night, part of Jeff's full-length interview. If you haven't checked that out, do so for sure. We'll put a link in the description below. Jeff points out there are a lot of errors in this report. As far as these diagrams, I think they're accurate and give us a good visual representation of how money is created. So let's look at the balance sheet of the central bank, the commercial banks, and the consumers as an aggregate total. Before the loans, the central bank has the reserves and currency on the liabilities side of their balance sheet. The commercial banks have deposits and assets, as we spoke of earlier. The consumer has the deposits on the asset side of their balance sheet, maybe along with some currency. And notice, 
that the deposits are on the asset side of the consumer's balance sheet, but the liability side of the commercial bank's balance sheet. And the combination between the deposits and the currency is what gives us broad money. When the commercial banks lend money, this creates a new loan on the asset side of their balance sheet, and it creates new deposits to match those loans that are liabilities. On the consumer's balance sheet, the new deposits created by the loans are assets, and the new loans are liabilities. And notice that the broad money has expanded and actually doubled, it looks like by this diagram, simply by the commercial banks lending more money into existence. This is why a lot of economists refer to bank deposits as fountain pen money created at the stroke of a banker's pen when they approve the loan. And this is also why we need to start looking at banks as money creators and not intermediaries. You'll also hear academics and bankers always talk about how additional savings doesn't really mean additional deposits. And I know that sounds a little bit weird, but here's what they're talking about. So Steve saved 10 bucks, put that in his bank account. And over here, store owner Owen with Bank B has $90 in his checking account. So because Steve saved this $10 doesn't necessarily mean that it's additional deposits because if he would have spent that $10 at Owen's store, well then Owen, instead of having $90 in savings, would have $100. The same amount of deposits we had before, but now it's in one bank account as opposed to split up between two bank accounts. Of course, where I would disagree with that is how they're defining the word savings. They see it as just additional currency in a bank account, where I see it not as currency, but your excess productivity. And if you look at savings as excess productivity, and that's what expands your purchasing power, the pie of savings can continually get bigger and bigger if Steve and Owen are continually producing more and more. We're not restricted to our savings by additional debt and the banks themselves. But let's go back to how banks are money creators, more specifically currency creators. We have to define the two, and I'm actually using money and currency in this video synonymously, and I shouldn't be doing that. So whenever I make that mistake, let me know in the comments. These banks are currency creators, and the only thing limiting the amount of currency in this system are the reserve requirements. And actually, that's not even a constraint. More on that in step number three. But let's move offshore for a moment, where most banks don't have reserve requirements. Bank D is offshore, and it is owned by this gentleman right here. His name is Baller, the bank owner. Baller, of course, has this amazing top hat with a money or a currency logo, and this gold chain like Mr. T, he is loaded. And the reason he is so loaded and smiling is because his bank doesn't need any money in it. On day one, he has zero assets, zero liabilities. On day two, he can create $1 billion in loans Therefore, $1 billion in deposits and electronic currency. I want to point out that Baller, the bank owner, can technically do this with zero dollars to begin with. And this is where we start talking about the euro dollar system. Whoa, time out. I've got a special bonus for you. This is the blow your mind bonus right here on the George Gammon channel. We're gonna do a quick little minute on the repo market, and this is all gonna tie in at the end of the video. I'm gonna put all the pieces of the puzzle together for you. The Fed is right here, and we've got primary dealer bank A, B, and C. As we know, they have accounts with the Fed, the reserve accounts, and the Fed has been injecting all this funny money into the repo market. 
the hedge funds, financial institutions, or maybe some of the banks themselves have been taking that liquidity and they give the Fed collateral mostly in the form of treasuries. So when we go to the New York Fed's website and see all that data that I've actually been using on a lot of my videos, and I'm sure you've seen the data as well, I'm assuming, and I think we're all assuming, that that data refers to the transactions between the Fed and whomever they are dealing with in the repo market itself. Well, I was wrong. And I think all of you were wrong as well. In my full-length interview with Jeff Snyder, you can see part two of that Sunday, part one, we put it up last night, Jeff Snyder actually tells me that I was wrong and he sets the record straight. Jeff points out that the Fed really can't go directly into the repo market because a lot of these institutions that they're lending to, they don't have reserve accounts with the Fed. In other words, the Fed is basically the bank of the primary dealers. But the only thing the Fed can do is inject liquidity or cash into the primary dealer's reserve accounts or any bank that's under the Fed's umbrella. And if the bank or lending institution or hedge fund is outside of the Fed's umbrella, the only way the Fed can get money to that entity is if they first and foremost give the money to the primary dealers. So all the data that we've been seeing on the New York Fed's website is not between the Fed and whomever is participating in the repo markets, between the Fed and the primary dealers. The Fed gives them the liquidity, they give the Fed the collateral, and what they do with the liquidity is up to them. The Fed is just keeping their fingers crossed that they go into the repo market, but they might not. This serves a very convenient purpose for the Fed. In my opinion, a little too convenient. Let me explain. The Fed is considered a lender of last resort. So if a financial institution gets into trouble, like Deutsche Bank, HSBC, or any of the usual suspects, if they have the collateral, they can go to the Fed or the central bank and say, listen, we've got all this collateral, we're illiquid, we need money to stay in business. And that central bank will say, okay, fine, here you go. That's what the discount window was set up for. The problem with the discount window is that it was public information. So any bank that went to the discount window to get money from the Fed would basically be admitting that they were broke. I call it the walk of shame. They go to the Fed, admit that they're broke, the market sees that, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the Fed could never use the discount window the way it was intended to be used. Why? Because it was public. They needed a system to bail out the banks that was anonymous. What is the repo market now that the Fed is giving the money directly to the primary dealers and they are doing who knows what in the repo market? Like Jeff Snyder told me in our interview, he says it's just like Vegas. Whatever happens in the repo market stays in the repo market. What they have effectively done is created a discount window for any of these financial institutions that are going bust that is completely anonymous. Step number three, fragility 10X. If you saw part one of my interview with Jeff Snyder last night, and if you haven't, make sure you check it out, link in the description below. You saw that he used a $5 bill to illustrate how the euro dollar system actually works. We've got the Bank of Jeff, the BOJ, not to be confused, of course, with the Bank of Japan. They couldn't lend out any money because they're completely insolvent due to negative interest rates, but the BOJ, Bank of Jeff, does not have that problem. So he has $5 to lend. That is a $5 customer deposit. 
Along comes the BOG, which is the Bank of Georgia. That's an offshore bank. We'll say it's somewhere maybe in Colombia. They need $5, so they go right over to Jeff, say, Jeff, buddy, I need that five bucks if you don't mind. They say, no problem. So that $5 gets lent over to the Bank of George and then becomes a loan on the asset side of Jeff's balance sheet and a liability on George's balance sheet. George now has the $5, which he can go ahead and lend out. So let's say there's a bank A in Singapore and corporation XYZ has a checking account there. They say, listen, George, we need a $5 loan, no problem. So that loan goes over to bank A. Bank A then has $5 as a liability. That's the checking account for corporation XYZ. Also has the $5 in reserves as assets and then George's balance sheet changes as well. Still have the same liability to their buddy Jeff, but now instead of the $5, they have a $5 loan that again went to Corporation XYZ. Well, Bank A knows that they're an offshore bank and they're not bound and restricted by those crazy reserve requirements. And they want to shoot for the moon. They want to boost profits as high as they possibly can. So they say, we're going to go ahead and lend $5 million against that $5 that we have in reserves. We're really going to go for it. We think the market's strong and there is no downside whatsoever. Okay, well, that also creates a $5 million deposit. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I got a little ahead of myself there. Before I go any further, let's go right to my interview with Jeff Snyder to hear him describe how out of control this offshore euro dollar system can actually get. That would become a deposit for them on their bank's balance sheet. It would become an asset to the bank as far as the, the cash equivalent. And then that process could just multiply over and over and over and over again to where you'd theoretically have a limitless amount of $5 bills that had been created from that one $5 bill that you have in Florida. Right. And that's that's essentially the point of the euro dollar system is that it, it, it create it's a bank centered system where what matters is you and I are both banks and we both agree on the terms. We don't care about this this physical five dollar currency. We only care about the numbers on our computer screens. That's all we care about. I've credited you with what you think is a five dollars. You accept that it's five dollars. Therefore, we're both good. Now, you can do whatever you want with those five dollars because they're on your they're on your books as five dollars. You have an offsetting liability. Everything is accounted for according to global conventions and we're all good. So if you want to send those five dollars to a bank in Singapore because they have a better opportunity to use them someplace else, and you think you can make a better spread on the five dollars, then fine. You, you can electronically transfer those immediately to the bank in Singapore and this $5 chain of liabilities grows and grows and grows and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, even though the original bill stays with me in Florida. Let's hop right back across the pond to the good old US of A. Repo market here, you're here holding a sign saying safety is number one. And you are so excited because you know your bank has reserve requirements so they're not going to go bust. They are going to be prudent and play it safe. Going back to step number one, your bank has $90 in loans, $10 in reserves, and $100 total in deposits. 10% reserve requirements. But then what happens is you take out and look at the fine print and you say, wait a minute here. My bank also has $50 million dollars and loans and they have 50 million dollars in deposits and they only have 10 bucks in reserves how is that possible well it's actually pretty easy your bank has an account with bank a and let's say they go through the repo market or they go directly from bank to bank but the reason Bank A created that loan or deposits for $5 million was to lend it to your bank. Your bank takes that $5 million, goes on to the asset side of their balance sheet as reserves, and they lend 
$50 million and create $50 million of deposits based on that $5 million that they borrowed from Bank A, which got that $5 million from the $5 they got from the BOG, and the BOG got that $5 from Jeff Snyder's back pocket. Now you can understand why I call this part of the Jeff Snyder whiteboard series fragility. And let's not forget that all these transactions that happen in the repo market that could be going back and forth from the onshore entities to the offshore entities with the euro dollar system are completely anonymous. So for your friend and family member Fred that keeps telling you, don't worry about it. The Fed has total control over the US dollar money supply. I have got the hashtag of the day for them. Editor, go ahead and throw that up and make sure you follow me on Twitter. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.